We're live. So tonight, chapter 10, one sample, hypothesis testing. Tonight, we will be going through defining a hypothesis, explaining the process of testing a hypothesis. We will focus a lot of detail on applying the six-step procedure for testing a hypothesis. We'll distinguish between one-tail and two-tail hypothesis. We will conduct a test of hypothesis about a population mean, and we will compute and interpret the p-value. So we will be including those six objectives. What is a hypothesis? Statement about a population parameter subject to verification. A statement about a population parameter subject to verification. If you recall back to possibly elementary science class, you might have heard hypothesis stated as an educated guess. All right, so it's a statement about a population parameter. Now that population parameter, very commonly, is the mean. And we must put it through verification. Here's some examples. Pay is related to performance. People with higher wages perform better. Consumers prefer Coca-Cola over Pepsi-Cola. Billboard advertising is more effective than newspaper advertising. All of those may have been educated guests. And I'm going to put the line under the word educated because we're just not throwing something, some idea. We're not just, we're having some reason for introducing this hypothesis. But it's a statement about a population parameter <coughs> subject to verification. And through this six step process, we are going to verify. All right, over on page 317, you see there are six steps to hypothesis testing. We're going to write these here. We're going to use them all night. So what is step one? Go ahead. State the null and alternate hypothesis. What is the null hypothesis? What is the null hypothesis? The, the first step stated. The first step is to state the hypothesis being tested. It is called the null hypothesis. All right. It is the statement about the value of a population. This is what we're testing, and it will be noted by the H. No. Okay. Okay. Subset zero. So, step one. No, I'm not done with step one yet. All right. Next, we're going to state the alternate hypothesis. And what is the alternate hypothesis? The 
It's the statement that we are going to accept if there's enough evidence to prove that the null hypothesis is false. If this is false, this has to be true. If this is false, this will be true. Okay, step two. is to state a level of significance. Sometimes referred to as the level of risk. All right, now four. You're going to have this referenced from the Greek letter alpha. <coughs> it's important uh, when we talk about the level of significance or the level of risk, this is the level of risk of a probability of us rejecting the null hypothesis when it is actually true. So what's the level of risk that we reject the null hypothesis when it's actually true? What's the level of risk that you reject the hypothesis? The null hypothesis when it is actually true. With consumer research, It is common that you will use a 5% level of significance. For quality assurance, industries typically rely on a 1% level of significance. And for political polling, ten percent. Now, someone to explain to me why we would be willing. Bless you. Yeah. <laughs> why would we be willing to accept a ten percent level of significance with political polling, but only a one percent? with quality assurance. We have a the quality assurance is how the calls are product. The stakes are higher. The limits of liability, the risk of liability, the risk to the company, the risk to a society. You know, in these last discussions, there was a lot of talk about political polling and about the last elections and how there were some possibly not good sampling because some people kind of missed the call. You know, we opened this classroom discussion up with how do we select a sample? And again, how do we get a pure sample and how we strive to get a good sample? But still, is it more costly? And I define costly as total cost including that society part to it, but are the costs higher for someone trying to predict who the next governor of the state of Indiana is going to be, or a company that produces artificial hearts? Okay, now, under this, I'm going to put, what's a type one? Because here's the risk. 
We're going to define this. What is a type 1 error? Rejected in all hypotheses, HO, what is true? So you reject the null hypothesis when it's true. How would we define a type 2 error? The opposite. Not rejecting, Not rejecting it when what? Not rejecting the null hypothesis when it is false. And this will be defined with the Greek symbol of beta. What is beta? The type 2 error. So we can and the type one error come right there. back here and there you go. All right, step three. We are going to select our test statistic. Thus far, how many tests have you been introduced to? From last week. T and Z. So right now we're going to focus this on two tests. And I'm going to use the T and Z test to introduce you to hypothesis testing. I will tell you in later chapters, I'll introduce two other test statistics to you. I'll introduce an F test and a chi square. But right now we'll focus on the T and Z. I just want to know, um, I know that everybody, you know, concerned about final right now, looking how we look at the final. And I do know that this chapter is going to be very important and very important for the final. So if you don't mind, but you know, just deny whatever related to the final, if you can give it a sample or something for us to relate it. And, you know, we try to learn how to. Every week we go through an example in the book, and I'm going to take you through two examples tonight, following these six steps and plugging in for each of these steps. We'll do a one tail test and a two tail test. And we'll follow these six tests. In the next chapter, I'll show you two tests, not just a two-tail test, but we'll test two mains, two populations. And again, I'll use this six-part test. And can I apply to the final? How do we apply this to the final? I think the hardest thing would be applying this at first. Like it's providing the word portion of this final saying the you will write, correct. You will write because you have to interpret. Remember from the very first chapter, 2 plus 2 is 4. But just saying the number 4, it takes on no context. If we define 4 as in unemployment is 4%, or lunch costs me $4, now I put meaning behind it. So the writing component would be to explain what that result is, what it tells you, and if you're using this hypothesis testing, remember to test something, test that parameter, that mean about the population, you would write to tell me what are you learning about the population. Good. All right, and if you go back to chapter 
8. No, excuse me, chapter 9. This is where we were. You know, they're on page 290. I would summarize that page. When do you use the T-test? When you don't have the population standard deviation? When you do not have the mean or the standard deviation, you're going to use a T-test. When you do have the mean and standard deviation, you're going to have a z-test. So when you're looking at your database, the first question that comes to mind, do you have those variables? Do you know the mean and standard deviation? And if you're able to calculate that, you're going to use the z-test. All right, so right now we said we would do those two. May have to switch to another color pink. Um, step four. <coughs> what is formulate the decision rule? Formulate the decision rule. All right, who can tell me about the decision rule? The decision rule is a statement of a specific conditions under which the null hypothesis is rejected, the conditions under which it is not rejected. The conditions in which the null hypothesis is rejected and is not rejected. And here's where you're going to in, introduce something called the critical value. The critical value, based on the selected level of significance, the critical value is the dividing point between the region where the null hypothesis is rejected and where it is not rejected. Think of that as the crossover point. Once I breach into that area, the straw that broke the camel's back. So everybody knows if I'm only concerned, if my critical value is here, and let's just say that. Is this a one tail or a two tail test? One tail. One tail. And if you have something that looks like that, is that is a two tail test. Look for language in the problem. Typically, if you see is something greater than or less than the mean? Do you think it's going to be a one tail or two tail test? Two. two. If you see it being just greater than or less than, one directional. One. Say that first one again, I'm sorry. If you saw an example that asked plus or minus the mean. Okay. Make sure. So look for key words. Look at what the question is asking you. And that's going to tell you, are you using a one or two tail test? All right, step five. You're going to make your decision. So 
So basically, um, the Bible, we also follow six step by six. You're going to follow the six test, six step test. So when you're formulating your decision at this point, you're going to go collect your sample. <coughs> then what are you going to do? You're going to collect your sample. You're going to form your decision rule. You're going to assign a critical value. You're going to perform your test. You're making your decision here based off of these two steps. Okay, you're going to make here, you're listing what kind of test you're forming. Here, you're stating your decision rule. Am I going to, re what's it going to take for me to reject or not reject? How do we find that? This is where you're going to be looking at your T or Z. Correct. And you're going to get that number off of the chart in the back of the book. You're going to look at what level of significance are we using? You'll have to decide, is it a one or two tail test? Telling you if you're going to have to split it. Then you're going to pull, you'll pull, you'll apply the formula, and then you'll compare that to the result in the back of the book. Okay, can I say again, how much do I understand? You select the sample, and then you do the best, and we do the decision rule and see which one. Well, right now you're going to select the sample, do the test, yeah. and then see how that test compares to your decision rule up here. And then what's the sixth step? And then you can proceed. Right? You're going to interpret the results. So here is where you're going to interpret. Do you accept or do you not accept the null hypothesis? So you're going to interpret and you can look at it and you ask, is there writing? This could be the writing component of this study. Usually you can summarize this though in one sentence. And then again, this is how you're proving your decision. Here you're interpreting it. Look at it like that. Here you're interpreting it. Here you are proving it. You're proving it through statistics. You're proving it through your analysis. You're proving it through your test. All right. Let's look at an example. If you will turn to <coughs> page three hundred and twenty four. So be like if we fall that in the and it should be okay. If you follow the six steps, you're gonna be okay. One advantage, one outside advantage that I see about a blindness and learning this process, this will hopefully start to set your mindset up on how you take a problem and can break it down into two steps. How you can see what you're trying to accomplish and how can you break that down into steps. Now I know another thing I went through graduate school with. We were having a conversation the other day and I said I look back on it and that is one thing that I took away from my more advanced studies in applying these types of procedures is yes I got more comfortable with statistics. Yes I got more comfortable with financial ratios but at the same time I was able to see what I was trying to prove, see what I was trying, where I was trying to go, 
and how I was able to break that down into a series of steps that I could follow. Okay. All right, let's look at Jamestown. Is it Jamestown Steel? <clears throat> okay, Jamestown Steel, what do they do? <clears throat> Looks like they manufacture desks. Wisconsin, you got any questions before we go into this? Um, nope, we're both good right now. All right, Just speak up if you do. All right, so Jamestown manufactures office equipment desk at several plants in Western New York. Weekly production of a model A325 desk at the Fedoria plant follows a normal probability distribution. So they're making a specific desk at this location and it follows, here's what it's telling us, it follows a normal probability distribution with a mean of 200 and a standard deviation of 16. Recently, due to market expansion, other methods have been introduced and new employees, new employees have been hired. So new methods of production and new employees have been hired. And the VP of manufacturing wants to investigate whether or not there has been a change in weekly production for this model desk. Is the mean number of desks at the Fedornia plant different from 200 at the 1% level of significance? Now, looking at the top of 325, in this example, what are you given? Excuse me. Is that the mean? You have the mean. So it's mean to mean is the mean, right? First, you're given that it follows a normal distribution. You are given the population mean. You are also given the standard deviation. All right, so since the population standard deviation is known, what are we going to use? Z test. Um, Z. Okay, so start. Step one. Two eyes. Can you see blue? Tell me I'm switching paint color. You good? Yep. All right. We can do a whole lot of writing with this one. Okay, so what is the null hypothesis? 200. Is the population mean equal to 200? So what is the alternate hypothesis? is not equal to 200. Now notice that this is a two-tailed test because it can go in either direction. We know right now that it can, if it's not equal to 200, it can be above 200 or it can be below 200. So we know right now that this is a two-tailed test. That's your question. If it was a one-tailed test, what would what would the problem be like? Remember, look for greater than or less than. Greater than or less than. So is the mean greater than 200? And we'll do a one-tailed test after this. All right, step two, what's the level of significance? 0 0.01. 0 0.01. Good job. And that was given to us. All right, step three. Select the test statistic. 
And as we just said, we know the population standard deviation, so we are going to use a z-test. Charlie, I feel like I'm almost see why it's angry. All right. Yeah, I see. Step four. Formulate the decision rule. Okay, let's look at the text. What's it tell us? In step two, we're using a level of significance of 0 0.01. So if I look at this, which area is going to be my rejection area? 0.005 on both sides. Correct, so you're gonna to have to assign you're going to have to split the one and so you're going to have in this area 0 0.4975 and 0.4975 no 0.495 let me split it right Does everyone go back to last week and remember an area of one is under the curve. The normal distribution, remember, my mean, median, and mole all come through the middle. Equal parts on each side. So if I take my level of significance of one and split it, this is where I'm getting the .005. Okay, now let's bookmark that page. And I want you to flip all the way back in your appendix to the inside cover of your text. And using, move to the top where you see, and I want you to point out that if we see one tail or two tail test, do you see the same graph? Okay, so select at the top column. Look at point zero 0.01. And then look at the last row for that symbol, which is going to denote an infinite degrees of freedom. I'm looking right here. Okay, so and make sure you're on the two tail test. And under a two tail test, point zero zero five. Okay. What value are you getting? I see 2.576. 
Everyone follow this. Look up at the very top here. Okay. Two tail test. Two tail test right there. Zero point five. Now go up here to the top. And we're at a point zero one. Oh, okay. Zero one. They come all the way down here to the infinite degrees of freedom because it's infinite here because we're it can right. run out continuously right. on either side. And come all the way down here, and you see 2.576. All right, so if I go back to this chart, we're going to say right here and right here. What was it? 0.29.2576. So this becomes the critical value. One more time, Charlie. What made this decision fit in right here on the bottom? Because remember, one of the characteristics of a normal distribution yeah, is that it, it never touches. So this could run out to infinity. Is it always going to be in for this for this class? If it is not, it will give you the degrees of freedom. Okay. How do you calculate the um, out of the Okay. Step. Five. What is our decision rule? <clears throat> or no, excuse me, number five, make a decision. Because remember, we're going to reject, we're going to accept if we're in this region, we're going to reject if we are outside of this region. All right, so real quick, we said we were going to use a Z test. So, a Z test. Sample mean minus. Okay, so it says take a sample from the population, and because the plant was down for two weeks, to so use 203.5. So of the sample that was selected, we got a sample mean of 203.5. So the sample mean is 203.5. What's the normal population mean? 200. 200. Now, how big was the sample that we took? Uh, 50. I'm sorry, we got the standard deviation. What's the standard deviation? 16 was given to you. And then, how big of a sample did you take? 50. 50. The fault for that. So in step six, interpret that result. It's the sample mean. If you look in step four, take a sample from the population. All right, so the mean number of deaths produced last week or last year, 50, because the plant shut down, so it's giving us right there 203.5. All right, so interpret this result. Well, 
Why would you not reject it? So look, we have failed to show that the population mean has changed from 200. To put it another way, the difference between the population mean of 200 and the sample mean of 203.5 could simply be due to chance. <coughs> Did not prove that any change to the production method or the hiring of new workers caused a change. And again, we're going to compare this with this critical value. We do not reject it. We would only reject it if this test, if this number here was greater than this number. Oh, because of 1.4, 1.47 is in the middle at the area of the group. Yep. So 1.547 is less, less than 0.2576. Correct. So we're, remember, this number here is going to fall within this number. Right. Or it's going to fall within this area. Oh, yeah. 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 So, yeah, so but if, if it was 0.1547 actually equal like 0.3168, then obviously it would be. We would, we would okay. reject. Those are a lot of chapters, I think. I got it now. Okay, in this last example, we did two tail test. What was our null hypothesis? <coughs> population mean was 200. And then we said here that the population mean was not equal to 200. And as I said, if you look at examples, that had If your null hypothesis is stated using greater than or less than a one tail test, greater than or less than and equal to one tail test. Okay, I also say that if you look at it being no more than at least has increased, is there a difference? These are all different languages that can be thrown in. But just visualize your graph, draw up your normal distribution, and ask yourself which direction am I trying to prove is outside the critical value. And if it affects both sides, we're a two-tail test. One side, a one-tail test. If you refer to your textbook on page Got another? Uh, oh, bless you. If you uh, refer to page 328 in the text, it's going to give you a little more detail there. All right, something else about our hypothesis. In that example, the null hypothesis was 200. And the alternate hypothesis was not equal to 200. Were those events mutually exclusive? What's that? I don't know. Yes. What is mutually exclusive? All right, wait, wait, wait. She's going to answer this. What is mutually exclusive? I remember. Look it up. Mutually exclusive. I asked someone else. 
Were they collectively exhausted? Could anything else been true? No, so they were collectively exhausted. Those two have to include everything, all possibilities. Someone help her out. Were they mutually exclusive? Yes. Yes, because you could have one or the other. Yeah, it had to be one or the other. It either was greater, it either was equal to 200, or it was not. Oh, so they okay. were mutually exclusive and they were collectively exhausted. They include all possible outcomes. Your null hypothesis is always presumed to be true. So remember, that is where you're starting out. That is what projection you are making, what assumption you're drawing. So you're going to presume that the null hypothesis is always true. You're going to say that the alternate hypothesis always has a burden of proof. Okay, it's got to prove that we reject or do not reject the null hypothesis. All right, let's look at an example here of a one tail test. All right, first, let's define the p value. On page 329, what is the p-value? Probability of observing a sample value as extreme as or more extreme than the value observed, given that the null hypothesis is true. All right, so the textbook says the probability of observing a sample value as extreme as or more extreme as the value observed given the null hypothesis is true. You know, the p-value can the probability value here. It's saying almost, and I translate it this way, that whatever deviation we're seeing was caused by, in that example, it was caused by pure probability, pure chance, not related to any of these other factors. All right, so let's look at a one-tailed test. And this is on page 331. All right, so keep in mind this p-value and in this example, Yes, know that we could use the p-value. We're not in this example, but we could use the p-value to the level of significance. All right, so let's look at the McFarland group. All right, so then we're going to do a one tail. So we're going to follow these six steps. All right, at the bottom of page 331, the McFarland insurance Claims department reports that the mean cost to process a claim is $60. An industry comparison shows this amount to be larger than most other insurance companies, so the, ins the company has instituted cost-cutting measures. Now you're always asking about real-life examples. Here's an example. Insurance companies just found out they're paying $60 to process a claim and that those costs are greater than their competitors. Now they're going to try to bring their cost in line with their competition. All right, to evaluate the effect of this cost-cutting measures, the supervisor has selected a random sample of 26 claims processed last month. The sample information is reported below, so we are given a 1% significance level. And the question is, is it reasonable to conclude that a claim is now less than $60? 
What's step one? State the null hypothesis. And what is our null hypothesis? It's asking to conclude that a claim is now less, less than $60. There's your key phrase. Now we're talking about a one tail test. So our null hypothesis is going to be that the mean Hi. Sorry. No, 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 no. You're good. Good? Yep. Thank you. So that the null hypothesis is equal to the mean is greater than or equal to $60. So what is the alternate hypothesis? That it is less than or equal to $60. Actually, let's say that it was less than $60. Because our ask is now less than $60. Step two. Select the level of significance. Zero point zero one. Point zero one. And that was given to us. Step three. What are we using? B. We are going to use the T test. All right, now what important step do we make here? Do you know the standard deviation of the population? No. 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 <laughs> so what can we assume here? Seven. Using the standard deviation from our sample. All right, so for a t-test, let's define this. What are we equal to? What's our formula? We're working through on page 333. All right, step four, formulate a decision rule. Okay, so again, bookmark this, and where is it directing you to? The back of the book. The back of the book. Mm -hmm. So let's flip back to Appendix B5. Or just look at below in the text, it's giving you the one section that you need right here. All right, so now let's look, the far left column. You see where we're referencing the degrees of freedom. And remember here, you're given a sample size of what? Twenty-six. For the degrees of freedom, you're going to take that size minus one. Now remember, before we went to an infinite number because we could have ran out in either direction. 
And be sure that up at the top, you know that we are dealing with a one-tail test. So if you look at that chart, the one-tail test is on the top and then below it is the two-tail. Make sure you're looking at the column header for a one-tail test. And if I take the 0 0.01 level of significance under a one-tail test and I come down to 25 degrees of freedom, Do you see where they're getting 2.485? All right, now, how are we getting 56.42? A sample mean? Okay, your sample information is up on the top of page 332. And so the sample mean is 5642. What's the population mean? 60. 60. Now we had to solve for this. What's the standard deviation of this sample? I'm going to tell you that it's dollars and four cents. You're going to have to calculate that. And the square root of our sample size is 26. And if you solve this, you get 1 dollar and if I rounded it <coughs> 6 How do I interpret this? Have we proved or disproved? Disproved. And this, the language gets tricky here. Not disproved. I have two Two negatives. Two negatives. All right, so we have not disproved the null hypothesis. So would you go back and tell, what would you tell that manager? Was his cost measures effective? Was his cost cutting efforts effective? Yes. Can't conclude it. Cannot. I hear a not. I hear a not. I hear we could tell him he was effective.
The test results do not allow the claims department manager to conclude that the cost cutting measures have been effective. Who can explain that? So the question is, would we have been out? And let's look at this. Can you see this? All right. So we're going to do this. Right? And we're trying to say it's less than 60. And what was my critical value? 2 point, and we're looking at less than, so I know I'm going to be to the left. So point two four eight five. One tail test, we're going to load it all to the left. So out here is my rejection region. Anything in here we're going to say would have been effective. And where does 1.818 fall? To the left or right of this critical value? Right. It falls within this region. It falls what? Your rejection region is out here. So it would be to the left here. Okay. But the one point. Your 1.818 is going to be in this region. So reject, do not reject. 